And now we're ready for chapter seven, where uh, we go over licensing regulations. Um, when you read the book, the um, FCC uh, rules were uh, explained and the way they're organized. Uh, they talk a little bit about amateur radio's missions, uh, types of licenses, uh, licensing exams, volunteer examiners, uh, your responsibilities. Uh, frequency and emission privileges, international radio rules, and amateur call signs. And all this is pretty straightforward, but I thought I'd go through and kind of point out some things that I think are uh, uh, you, you need to be aware of. So um, we'll go on here to uh, the next slide. And um, this is from FCC's Part 97, uh, which covers amateur radio, and uh, it goes through and states uh, the official mission uh, for amateur radio. And uh, the one thing I think you need to really um, make sure you understand is that uh, um, it's a non commercial activity, a non commercial communication service. Um, you really can't. Um, use ham radio to make money through the communication part of it so for example um, you can't uh, use it for uh, fleet control in your business uh, even if everybody uh, that was using it were licensed hams uh, you can't uh, broadcast commercials and that kind of thing uh, there's a, a definite delineation between commercial and non-commercial radio services so ham radio is definitely a non-commercial service and if the other things are what you want to do there are other uh, licensing uh, approaches uh, for commercial operation that you can explore so um, just keep that in mind non-commercial and uh, everything will work out great um, this is a, a copy of a, what your license will look like. It'll be sent to you by the FCC as a PDF file, and uh, it'll have an official copy uh, watermarked on it. Um, I would strongly suggest that you save this file um, in a place that's backed up so you can get to it. Um, there are two parts to the license that you can cut out. Uh, the top part, this particular license, is for our... Uh, club call sign kc3tl and uh, my name's on it because i'm the uh, trustee uh, for this call sign which means i have to make sure that uh, we adhere to all the uh, fcc rules and regulations when we operate with this call sign and um, you know just normal information you would expect uh, the grant date of the license uh, when it's effective uh, the um, print date and the expiration date and you can see that's uh, 10 years out from the initial date uh, what the uh, file number is the station privileges uh, here it's a club privilege and then there's another cutout that you can use um, uh, smaller for your wallet and i know for my personal license i have a copy of this signed laminated and i keep it in my wallet um, I don't know under what circumstance you could be asked to present your license, but whatever it might be, I'm ready. So uh, it may not be a bad thing to do either. Um, so that's uh, what your license will look like. And then uh, we kind of covered this earlier in uh, chapter one or two, I think it was. Uh, but uh, just as a reminder, the uh, uh, amateur license classes there are three of them there's technician uh, which you're studying for now there's general uh, and amateur extra and the first two technician and uh, general you have to get uh, 26 out of the 35 questions correct and uh, for amateur extra uh, you have to get 37 out of the 50 um, so that's uh, pretty straightforward and then the there's a uh, you'll encounter volunteer examiners at the exam and what they are are amateur radio licensees that um, have gone through training and passed a, a test uh, in order to administer the FCC test 
Um, so thing to note here, um, you need at least three VEs to be present for an examination session. Um, and uh, to give a technician exam, the VE has to hold a general class or higher license. And to give an amateur extra um, test, the VE has to hold amateur extra class um, license or and there is no higher so that that's the top end so um, technicians uh, can't uh, become ve's and give tests uh, but once you're a general you could get your ve and then you could administer with the group uh, you're associated with the technician exam and then once you're an extra then you can administer any one of the three uh, license classes in a uh, ve exam And this is just uh, right out of the book. It's an example of what the form will look like um, when you go take your test. And you'll be filling out the top part from here on up. And then the VE team will be filling out the rest of this. Um, this is uh, the date, uh, other relevant information to the test, what exams being taken. These are the three VEs and their call signs that are signing off uh, that you pass the test and um, this is your copy down here uh, that you can um, use let's say for example um, you take your test today and you pass your technician test and uh, say tomorrow you go to another test session and want to uh, take the general test but the FCC doesn't have you in the uh, database yet. So what you can do is you can present uh, the bottom part of this form to the VE team on the second day, and then that'll show them that you have satisfied uh, the requirements for uh, uh, the level two test. Not that that's what you'll do, but uh, this is just a good um, docu document for uh, uh, showing that you passed a certain level in the uh, progression of the uh, ham radio test and then once you receive your license then your license will become documentation that you've passed that uh, test this is uh, a look at uh, the pretty much the entire uh, frequency range uh, for communication and what we have here is if you start up here at the top these are the medium frequency uh, frequencies and medium frequency goes from 300 kilohertz to 3 megahertz and uh, then the next one up is um, high frequency and that goes from 3 megahertz to 30 megahertz and you can see how these are incrementing by a factor of 10 you go from uh, three or point three to three to thirty megahertz three hundred megahertz three gigahertz thirty gigahertz and uh, what this is showing with the black bands are the sections of that particular band that uh, amateur radio has privileges and the thing that's uh, interesting about this is it has um, a pretty good dispersion uh, the amateur radio has privileges pretty well spread out through the whole uh, frequency range uh, to do whatever um, you want to do in uh, amateur radio. Uh, generally, most of the uh, uh, technician activity like we talked about, let's see, where is it? It would be down. Okay, here's the uh, two meter VHF. And then here's the 70 centimeter UHF. So as a technician, you're going to be operating here and here. And you can um, uh, operate, let's see, where's 10 meters? It's back up here. You have some privileges here. And then what happens, and you also have these privileges down here in these um, uh, very high frequency ranges. And then when you get your general, then all of this opens up to you.
and then uh, there's subsets within this uh, range that you can access as a general and then when you get the extra license then you have um, privileges to access the full ham range in these frequencies so um, depending on what you want to do um, there's a lot of uh, capability there uh, in terms of uh, bands that you can work Um, then there's the, the nomenclature, the way people talk about the bands. And I think we mentioned this earlier in one of the earlier chapters, uh, but they, they can be referred to either in terms of frequency or in wavelength. And, uh, for example, uh, people talk about six meter band or 50 megahertz, uh, band. And, um, uh, they're interchangeable, uh, because if you know one, you can get the other one. If you remember, um, if um, you know the wavelength in meters, if they say six meters, then the frequency in megahertz is 300 divided by that six meters. So that'd be 50 megahertz. And that's where that comes from. And then also, if you know the frequency and want to know what the wavelength is, you can divide 300 by the frequency and get um, the wavelength in meters. So in this case, if we looked at uh, 300 divided by 50, that gives us 6. So uh, they're interchangeable um, in terms of uh, the way they're being described. And as you get, as you start using uh, the, uh, the bands, uh, this will kind of become automatic. You'll know, for example, that uh, 40 meters is uh, 7 point something uh, megahertz and 20 meters is 14 something megahertz. Uh, because you're, uh, you've been using them, and uh, it's just something uh, you know. And then I uh, had a little table here in the chapter on uh, most popular VHF and UHF technician amateur bands, and they list here the 6 meters, 2 meters, uh, 1.25, and then the upper, the uh, ultra-high frequency range. Um, and as we talked earlier, the primary ones that you'll probably be dealing with will be two meters and 70 centimeters. And the thing, another thing that's interesting is that uh, this is designated for uh, ITU Region 2, which is the United States and a, a bunch of other countries. Each country has, um, they, they're being sovereign states, they manage their own frequency spectrums. So different uh, countries can have different uh, uh, band restrictions or band privileges in these bands and the, the other bands for ham radio. Um, a good example of that is that uh, Canada uh, gives uh, their operators um, privileges in the, uh, on the HF band, say on uh, uh, 20 meters, they give their operators privileges in what we consider the extra class. So you'll see Canadian uh, stations in the extra class that you won't be able to get to if you just have a, uh, a general license. Um, the other thing that uh, you'll see occasionally um, on uh, 7 um, or 20 meters, for example, is in the evening, uh, there are stations uh, around the world that power up their AM commercial uh, broadcasting power. And um, you'll start seeing, um, uh, oh, you'll, you'll hear Iranian and Iraqi and Middle Eastern type music uh, on the uh, 20 meter band. And uh, there's nothing we can really do about it because each country manages their own uh, frequencies. In addition to the VHF and UHF uh, privileges you'll get with your technician license, uh, you'll also uh, have uh, privileges on some of the HF bands. And uh, 10 meters, for example, um, from 28 to 28.3 megahertz, You'll be able to operate uh, CW RIDI, which is a digital mode, uh, kind of a radio teletype, and other data modes such as a PSK31 or um, FT8. There's a variety of digital modes. 
Um, you can also operate CW from 28.3 to 28.5 uh, megahertz. Uh, and that's where you can do um, CW and single sideband. Uh, then on 15 meters, you can do uh, CW only in this part of the band, and then CW on uh, 40 and 80 meters within those uh, frequency bounds. Um, now, we've uh, our group has established some frequencies for communication locally on HF, and 10 meters in particular, uh, we've selected frequencies that uh, for uh, single sideband or phone, which is the same thing, are in this 28.300 to 28.500 megahertz. So that if you get your technician's license and have an HF radio capable of uh, operating in 10 meters, you'll be able to communicate uh, in this frequency range with um, uh, our group when uh, we do things. And I think that's about all there is. For that, we've also specified some frequencies for different uh, uh, digital modes in this uh, 28 to 28.3 range, too. So get your license. Um, we'll have a uh, uh, new ham uh, kind of a seminar uh, that will be included in some of the information we'll give you to help you get started. Uh, the different uh, emission types um, that uh, you'll find in amateur radio include uh, CW, which is the Morse code, uh, data, uh, when that's primarily computer-to-computer -computer communication modes, and often referred to as digital modes. Uh, there's some image emissions or image uh, modes that are used, uh, both slow scan and fast scan uh, television. Uh, you can send uh, faxes uh, over the radio waves, uh, tone modulated CW, um, phone, which is speech or voice, uh, then there's pulse, uh, RIDI, radio teletype, narrowband direct printing telegraphy, uh, spread spectrum. Um, I think we get into that a little bit in the general uh, course. Uh, but what that is, is that the um, signal is uh, sent out over uh, a wider range of uh, frequencies, not the narrow uh, range like you see with single sideband. And then there's provisions for test if you want to uh, uh, play around with uh, trying to do something. Uh, there are ways that uh, that can be managed and allowed. Um, a lot of that goes on in the uh, microwave above the uh, UHF frequency range right now. There's a lot of activity and that kind of stuff. So if uh, that's the kind of thing you're interested in, there's uh, plenty of room to do it. Okay, now there are power limits uh, that we have to adhere to. And uh, one specification you'll see is um, peak envelope power. And uh, what peak envelope power is, it's the average power during one RF cycle of the radio signal. So in this case, we have an amplitude modulated uh, sine wave, a carrier. The carrier is running at the high frequency. And the peak envelope power is the average power of the highest magnitude cycle. So this red cycle here. Uh, you would calculate or measure the uh, uh, average power of that cycle, and that would be the peak envelope power. And then on a uh, CW wave, uh, peak envelope power is measured during the key down period and when the transmitter is on. So this is um, a CW tone. Uh, and it would just be, since it's constant amplitude, uh, the peak envelope power would be the average power of one of these cycles. And then uh, there are a few restrictions, but generally amateurs are allowed a uh, full legal limit of 1500 watts peak envelope power. Uh, 
you won't be able to transmit higher power than that. Um, and then there are some uh, further restrictions that below 30 megahertz uh, novice and technician license are limited to 200 watts peak envelope power on HF bands. And that's really not going to be a problem for you. Let's say you want to do some HF communication locally on 10 meters with us. Uh, generally, we run about 20 to 50 watts uh, to make good contact uh, in that range. Um, and uh, your first HF rig will probably be uh, limited to 100 watts uh, peak envelope power. So uh, it should be more than enough to do what you want to do. Uh, there's another concept in uh, amateur radio of a primary and secondary allocations. Now this is in reference to the frequency bands. And all the bands in our band plan that are shown, uh, amateur radio is the primary uh, user of those bands. So we have first priority to it. There are uh, band, 60 meter band for example, where amateur radio is a secondary allocation. And what that means is that if someone other than a ham radio operator that has a primary allocation wants to use the frequency, the ham has to defer and let that individual or use the frequency. And in 60 meters, it's uh, further a little different in that there are only uh, five specific narrow bands of frequencies that we can use. And um, since we're secondary, uh, and I think the primary allocation is to some government agency. If you're using one of these bands uh, on the 60 meter band and uh, someone comes on the air and wants to use it, you have to uh, change frequency and uh, allow them access to that band. Uh, this is just a map showing the uh, um, the call number uh, for different regions. Uh, for example, your call sign will be probably something like KC3 and then three characters. It, it'll be automatically generated by the FCC. And what the three indicates is that you're in call area three, which includes Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, and Maryland. And then call area two is up here, call area one is the northeast part. And it kind of get a feel from a person's call sign what general part of the country they're from. But that isn't always the case because with vanity call signs, you can change this number if you want. And if, let's say, for example, you live in Texas and have a KC5 call sign and move to Mich Michigan, you can keep that KC5 call sign. So it's not a uh, uh, real exact uh, indicator of where the uh, the ham is from, but it's kind of a general uh, idea of uh, where they might be from. And then uh, taking a look at call signs by class, uh, we'll start at the uh, entry level, the technician, uh, or novice, which is an older license, and uh, club calls. Uh, those have to be two letter prefixes beginning with K or W, uh, then a number, and then a three letter su suffix, and that's referred to as a two by three. So there's two in the prefix and three in the suffix. And then generals can have. Uh, and this is usually obtained through a, uh, getting a vanity license, one letter prefix beginning with KN or W, and then a three letter suffix. So that's referred to as a one by three call sign. Uh, my call sign, K3SKS, is a one by three. Um, advanced, which is another older license that's still in effect, uh, two letter prefix beginning with KN or W, and two letter suffix, a two by two. And if you're amateur extra, uh, the prefix KN or W with two letter suffix is allowed. Um, or you can have a two letter prefix beginning with A and K or W and one letter suffix, a two by one. And a two letter, uh, you can have one uh, beginning with A and a two letter suffix, which would be a two by two. 
Now the thing is though, these one by twos are hard to get uh, because everybody kind of snatches them up. Uh, it's particularly handy in Morse code. The shorter your call sign is, the easier it is to uh, uh, send your call sign. So the uh, one by twos are in a pretty uh, big demand. Now you don't have to get a vanity license. You can get your initial license uh, from the FCC and use that license call sign through your whole uh, your whole life if, if that's what you'd like to do. But some people like um, getting a vanity call sign. And that's about it for chapter seven. Uh, I think next will be chapter eight, so we'll see you there.